Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. Welcome home, y'all. This is episode 15 of Native Land Pod, where we give you all of our political takes on everything politics and culture and a quick and easy digestible breakdown. We are your co-hosts, Tiffany Cross, Angela Rye, and I am Andrew Gillum. What's going on, Tiff and Rye? How are you and your part of the country? Welcome home, y'all. Welcome home. I got to say, I don't like it because we're remote again. (laughs) And I feel like when we're together, we have a lot more fun. Um, So it's like trying to hang out with your people. I kind of think you've been having fun without us. Yeah, but I like having fun with the whole world. (laughs) Or <laughs> she telling on herself? Well, she, it says weed is vegan. Weed is for vegan. those of y'all can't see. Um, but uh, we're still veg. reunited. <laughs> and it feels, and it feels so, good. so good. In this week's episode, Trump's second trial in. Uh, l- I don't know, count them, 365 is underway. But this one is a criminal indictment being bought by New York prosecutor Alvin Bragg. The Stormy Daniels hush money case um, and trial rather started on Monday with jury selection. The former president will be getting, count them, four free days of publicity uh, every week for as long as the trial lasts due to his alleged propensity toward wrongdoing. SCOTUS also appears to be wild, and if this week's oral arguments and the obstruction of justice case are any indication of things to come about the insurrection and its protests. Lots to get to on that. Then for this week's deep dive, we're going to get into minority rule, which happens when the minority of the population controls the levels of government uh, so that basically the rest of us, the majority, live under the control of a small minority. Is this what the framers intended? And is this the kind of democracy we're living under? Also, it is Black Maternal Health Week. Black mothers face disproportionately high rates of maternal and infant mortality. And these are absolutely preventable deaths, which is why it's so important that we talk about them. We all know that politics are everywhere. And this week, it is all about women's salaries in sports. College basketball star Caitlin Clark and some of our faves, Angel Reese, and Camila Cardoza were just drafted into the WNBA and folks are surprised, maybe horrified, even outraged at how much, or rather, how low women's salaries in sports still unfortunately are. And then commemorate, along with my co-host Tiffany Cross, <laughs> 420, we will not blaze it up like we did last week. No, we but- didn't. No, I'm messing with you. I'm talking about last week's episode. But we do want to ensure that you know that politics of cannabis are indeed everywhere. Stick around for some great questions and comments from our Native Land Pod fam. And of course, our calls to actions from each of the hosts. Stay tuned, everybody. It's going to be a good one. Trump's trials continue this week. He's facing charges in New York for hush money payments that he made during the 2016 election cycle to adult film star Stormy Daniels. It's the first time in U.S. history that a former president is being tried on criminal charges. Jury selection began on Monday in the case that's expected to, I don't know, disrupt, maybe some might argue, help Trump during this presidential contest as he is going to be on trial at least, we believe, for the next month or two. Um, Now, y'all, I understand yesterday, or rather earlier this week, seven jurors were chosen for um, uh, uh, to serve as part of the official trial. They were sworn in. They make up, I believe, four men, three women. Among them are two lawyers. Um, There are 11 more jurors to be selected. 34 counts of falsifying business records altogether is what is involved in this trial. And as I said, uh, jury selection did begin earlier this week, and it's expected to be over uh, by the end of this week, early next week, with uh, statements for opening beginning on Monday. Now, y'all, Trump 
could not help himself. Um, we heard earlier in the in the selection, he was batting his eyes, maybe giving them a little bit of a rest uh, throughout the process. But we know he was uh, alive and in effect during the break. This is what he had to say when he was able to step out of the courtroom. So if you look at uh, Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, all great legal scholars, there's not one that we've been able to find that said this should be a trial. I called a, I was, I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? I was paying a lawyer and some accountant marked it down as a legal expense. Did I hear an admission, y'all? What do you think? I think that I want to shout out the first black uh, DA in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, who is following in the successful footsteps of the um, dynamic Tish James in yes, being right, the attorney. second black attorney to be able to go after Donald Trump. And um, it's no wonder they are so afraid, as our good sister Joy said, of DEI because <laughs> DEI is coming for this dude. Yeah, I also I think. think it's important to note um, that this is, you said it in the rundown, Andrew, it's, it's uh, Donald Trump's first of several criminal trials. Um, this one, of course, in New York. Um, a lot of this could get put on hold based on what we talk about uh, next in the Supreme Court, what they end up deciding in that presidential immunity case. A lot of this could end up um, being of no consequence um, when we get to where, where they land in June or July when those decisions come out in the summer. No, that's right. I, I just thought it was odd. I don't know if you, you for those who were listening to the audio and, and weren't looking at it, um, as Donald Trump says, I was talking to a lawyer and uh, I, I paid a lawyer and some accountant wrote it down as a legal expense. His lawyers begin to look at each other in the back and they sort of start to confer. And I'm like, man, this guy is got to be making your job that much harder. Uh, but for him to admit, I paid I paid this guy, um, uh, my lawyer. Um, and of course, the allegation here is that he paid his lawyer to pay Stormy Daniels. That would be uh, Rather Cohen to repay, to, to endorse. People uh, trying to figure that out. Yeah, Michael, correct. I, but mm -hmm. because he didn't name check him, he just said, I paid a lawyer. And it was later then noted as such. Um, but he pays he pays Cohen, uh, reimburses Cohen an amount. They mark it down as a business expense. And that's exactly what is in the crosshairs here, that you cannot write it down as an expense for business if it is, in fact, a payment for a bribe. Or to silence someone. It's hush um, money. 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to hide reimbursement payments to former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen is the, is the Well, case. can I just say, I think it's important. Had I had time, I definitely would have pulled some sound from Stormy Daniels because I think it's important to remind people what <laughs> happened exactly yes. that evening. Um, Stormy Daniels was 27 years old at the time. Donald Trump was 60. It was a really compelling interview uh, that Anderson Cooper did, solid journalist and a great journalistic uh, interview he did with her because he allowed her to to tell her story. A 27-year-old woman had gone to his room. She was an adult film star. She's very clear this was not a Me Too situation. Um, she had gone to the bathroom, and when she came out, he was on the bed propositioning her, and she just looked like, blech. Uh, she said, you know, this was not something that she wanted to do. Melania had just given birth to their son um, just like maybe two or three months prior. Um, he was offering her, asking her, would she be willing to be a contestant on The Apprentice? Stormy Daniels is an adult film star. She is no fool. She actually ran for Senate, I want to say in 2018. She's been a, a, a well-known adult film star, but also has dabbled in politics and has been very well aware. This 60-year-old man, um, before he was president, when he was having sex with her, did not wear a condom um, with her. So I think these things are important uh, to, to note for this quote-unquote conservative, right-wing, self-described um, 
pro-life party that they are uplifting, this is your president. So outside of whatever moral or ethical issues you have, I, I am not here to, to make that um, judgment. I'm just putting out the story. But aside from these moral ethical judgments that people have, then you have the legal issue, Andrew, which you just pointed out. Michael Cohen paid her. And yes, you a very keen observation that he just came out and admitted it. What he didn't say is what he paid her for. So while that might not have been illegal, but certainly it's something that the American body politic should be reminded of because our attention span for such things is very short. And because there's been uh, 50, 11 tr trials and updates and minutia each day on, on his legal troubles, people have a tendency to forget what this was actually all about. We can just reduce it to the hush money trial, but let's remember the actual details of it. I have to say what disgusts me, to be honest, we have not learned our lesson. And I look at cable news and the anchors and the executives salivating and tripping over themselves to carry this wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's like, yes, we have our new, um, you know, courtroom drama that we can, you know, blanket our, our coverage with. And I, I do. October surprise. Uh, yes. And it's like we get to have our um, cable ratings boon again. We can have all these, uh, you know, people tune into the breaking news banner constantly. And just this week alone, and most people, unfortunately, do not consume paper. So just this week alone, I think of all the news that was not reported, that was overlooked, we're on the brink of, I dare say, perhaps another third world war. And we don't get to, to deep dive and dissect those issues because we're looking at the reality TV show, former president president turn our media industry and our electorate into another reality TV show. So I just get really tired and kind of checked out when uh, I see it. I know it's important, but I, when I look at it, it's I get sick huge. of it. It's huge. Historical. Yep. It's first historical. Time I just think there's a president so has many ever, other things, you know? The, yeah, but I, look, the first time a former president has ever been char like, car charged criminally is a big I deal. I completely so agree. I, I just don't think it should saying, be 24 but... hours. Like, okay, we got the update. This whole thing. Well, we can move on to the Supreme Court. Well, oh, yeah. I, okay, I, let's I also move on to the Supreme Court. I mean, I think part of it is, um, uh, Tiffany, is I think we we oftentimes move very quickly past things that are, you know, that are, in my opinion, considered important. And I do think it will weigh on some people if this man is found guilty because it changes, it shifts, right? Right. He's been able to escape mm -hmm. all the yeah. way through this thing, any real responsibility, culpability for what he does. And I'm wondering really with bated breath, whether or not the Supreme Court is about to allow him to skate on something, frankly, that would be yes, precedent setting, but I think would upend a lot of people's faith in, in, in the Supreme Court and in our quote unquote system of justice and accountability. And what I'm referring to is the fact that there is a case that was argued before the Supreme Court this week around whether or not um, um, two of the four uh, charges that were bought by Jack Smith, the special prosecutor here against Trump, are likely to be dropped or not. And because we've got an, a, 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 how do I say, incredible attorney right here as one of our co-hosts, um, Angela, I'd love if you could take a minute just to break down into dissectable and understandable ways what the implications are from this week's oral arguments and obviously its later decision, which will come from the court, we believe, in a month or so. Okay, so this particular case is uh, Fisher versus United States. And in this case, what is at issue is Section 1512 of uh, Chapter 18 of the United States Code. And here they are basing their entire argument, they being Fisher's side, their entire, entire argument over this particular clause. Whoever corruptly alters, destroys, mutilates, or conceals a record, document, or other object, or attempts to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding or, and they go into other um, examples of obstruction. Fisher's lawyer is trying to argue that this statute is supposed to be about documents. However, if you go down and notice I said or, in law school you learn the difference between an and or or. And there and are or. other places where you learn a difference between an and or, I don't know, first, second, third, fourth grade, right? So there's an or here. It says, or otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so, right? So that second part, that that two, 
and not the one, but the two, is what is at issue here with all of the folks who went to Capitol Hill at the behest of Donald Trump and his senior advisors to try to stop the steal, as they called it. The steal was the election, them certifying the election in Congress, which is an official proceeding, which is absolutely obstruction. It's obstruction of justice. It's an, it's a, a, an obstruction of a, an official proceeding. And they said say, they also are arguing corruptly. Well, can they argue corruptly? Yes, because Donald Trump, who was the leader of this movement, was trying to get folks to go to Capitol Hill to stop the steal. Meanwhile, that's exactly what he was trying to do still. So that's what it, what is is what it what is what is at issue here, and what you saw the justice mostly arguing about is what happens when you are on the outside of this statute when the when you're really close to those parameters, and you can all you all can start to imagine if this case was for something else, something that we were in favor of, if we were concerned, you know, that something else was going on, that they were about to pass a law in Congress that was going to be super harmful for us and we're protesting it, which is gonna get us to our next case, Tiff, what happens? What are the parameters there? So how far are they gonna go here? And it's really unclear where they're gonna land because there were arguments and questions from the more progressive justices as well as the super conservative ones. I don't know where they're gonna land here. Is very fascinating. I'm be real frustrated if this dude escapes culpability. Yet okay, again. I have a question. So one, when you say U.S. code, I was just asking this. Um, you, th- when you say the laws on the books, that's not the Constitution. That no. is federal law. The, yes. So the Congress has the responsibility of passing laws. Those things become United States code when pr- the president signs them into okay. law. Right. We have criminal statutes. That's what this mm-hmm. is. We also have civil statutes. Um, things like the CARES Act, which we are affiliate, uh, familiar with, the CARES Act is is something that is um, uh, is code, but it is not criminal code. This is criminal code. So um, then, two questions: the trial in New York that is a criminal case. Were Donald yes. Trump to be found guilty, what could he potentially be facing? Well, that I think was it thirty four or forty indictments just on that one case. Yeah, thirty-four. Yeah, and I've been something, and um, th- th- that that also is a state case and not a federal right. case. Right, I, I get it. I guess so I'm just it, I, my real question, to be honest, is: is there a, any scenario in which Donald Trump will s- be sentenced to some sort of jail time? Four, four years in prison, potentially. Okay, four years in prison. And so, should this president thirty-four count. be convicted? Mm-hmm. Is there a realistic chance that he will walk into prison with Secret Service and everything while running for president and and serve? Or will this case likely advance to the Supreme Court at some point? The criminal case I'm talking about. Oh, Alvin Bragg's? No. no. Because it's a state case. Yes, but there are instances where state cases find their way to the Supreme Court. It is when there is a constitutional issue in question. Even at the crux of this particular statute, they're arguing the, the the language in that statute, but also what is at issue here is right to protest, right to assemble, which is exactly what happened in DeRay oh, McKesson's case that, that the Supreme Court decided not to hear. So, Tiff, I know you had something yes. on that. Yeah, Tiff, before you before you do that, just wrapping this piece, the, the case that is right now being argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, the biggest... Um, impact we think can come from it is it could up in both the trials in Georgia as well as the trial in Miami mm. because both those cases one deals with um, uh, uh, Trump's handling obviously of classified information and the other uh, dealing with his actions in Georgia to technically uh, interfere with uh, with this legislative process. So I, I think we're going to keep watching this, but the oral arguments, if you want to hear them, maybe we'll be able to tr- try and post them somewhere on our account. But I know Tiff on the, on the DeRay piece, yeah. you've got an interesting Real crux quick, to Real Andrew, just for yeah. clarification too, on this last point you just raised, I think the bigger concern is the presidential immunity piece, which they are deciding in June or, in, or July, that that is really what could append those other cases. This is the, the I guess you could argue the obstruction related to the um, tampering of, of votes in Atlanta for or Georgia for sure. But I think really everything gets upset if they end up saying If they decide he yeah, can't be as a president. Can't be prosecuted. prosecuted. Which, you know, yeah. I have to Correct. say on that case, as a layperson, um, hearing some of the defense argument, I, it is it's worth the conversation to have because I get the point. It's like, well, if this president 
orders the military to engage in, you know, an assassination of someone that they're taking out, can they then later be prosecuted? I, I think these do get into legal waters that we've, you know, never before really um, swam in, but that's what happens when... Uh, never before hand Right, I was going to say, so that's crazy. what happens when you elect a clown to the highest office of the land, you turn our country into a circus, and we're seeing that happen right now. Mm. But you brought up the point about Supreme well, Court. that's a bar. That... Um, D. Ray McKesson. So the Supreme Court refused, I want to be clear, the Supreme Court refused to hear this case. So it got kicked back down to the lower court, the Fifth Circuit Court. Um, Angela, you'll correct me, please, if I say anything wrong um, legally. So I, I just want to really quickly try to say what is at issue here. So in 2016, D. Ray McKesson, you guys know D. Ray McKesson in the blue vest, um, an activist. He was helping um, or was invited to organize or help participate in a protest near police headquarters uh, in Baton Rouge. This was after police there shot Alton Sterling, um, a 37-year-old black man. They'd already immobilized him, uh, pinned him to the ground, but shot him six times, murdering him. And during that protest, we don't know who, during that protest, someone threw a rock and injured, severely injured a police officer. The police officer then um, sued D-Ray, um, or DeRay, rather. I keep saying DeRay like the comedian. DeRay. And uh, I want you all to hear directly from DeRay what exactly happened that evening from his perspective. Take a listen. So in November 2016, there was uh, the police killed uh, Alton Sterling and they killed uh, another man. And it was a big uproar in the country. And the Baton Rouge organizers were like, can you come down? I was like, yeah. And I'm in Baton Rouge for like, I don't know, 15 hours. Like I, I wasn't in Baton Rouge a lot. I like literally landed. We met with some people. Then I went to sleep because I was exhausted wake up and then we go out and it's sort of like, you know, we blocked up this big highway. The police were like on 10,000. It was just like a whole thing. And the police at one point were like, get out of the street. And I'm like, cool, I just started this job. I was a chief in the capital for the school system. I told the superintendent I wouldn't get in. Like I, I'd sort of like lay low, let me get out of the street. Mm. So I videotaped him. He's like, get out of the street. I show like the line where like the street is. I'm like, I'm out the street, cool. And the next thing I know, people are running. So I get caught in like this rush of people running. I fall, not a big deal. I go to get up and I can't get up. And I'm like, dang, I'm like really, I'm like pinned down in this group of people. And I realized that the reason I can't get up is actually the police are holding, they're like pressing my shoulders down. Not good. So then I throw my phone. I don't even know what I was thinking. I throw my phone because I don't want the police to get my phone. So I throw the phone, hoping my friends get it. And then I'm in custody for like the next 16, 17 hours. So that started it, but you know, it was one of those things where like the police, a police officer said that night that he got hit by a rock and that I was the cause of him getting hit by a rock. So why this is interesting, and I wanted you all to hear directly from DeRay, is because this is a First Amendment issue. This is the right to gather and protest. So Ellie Massog does a great piece on this in The Nation. I encourage you all to listen to it. But essentially, anybody can show up to a protest, wreak havoc, disappear, and then ruin the protest. We saw during the unrest of 2020, a lot of people who didn't look like us coming into our neighborhoods, giving young black youth bricks to throw, inciting and encouraging um, violence. And so it's really interesting to see what will happen um, that the, the Supreme Court decided not to take up this case, which was essentially, I think, making a statement that will impact how we all protest. And it comes down to, yes, you have the right to assemble and protest under the First Amendment unless you are Black. Now, when you look at what happened on January 6th, this is exactly what happened. Donald Trump incited a riot. He encouraged people to go, and certainly those police officers were injured by people he encouraged. So people like Harry Dunn, who's now running for Congress, he was uh, assaulted. Can he now sue Donald Trump? Well, according to the law, he cannot because what Donald Trump is being accused of, I, I think there, is obstruction of Congress, not uh, negligently inciting a riot. What I ask is the difference. So I think this is an interesting case, and I just thought the parallels between the two were quite striking. But be sure to read Ellie Mastal's piece in The Nation because he does a great job breaking it down. Meanwhile, the other difference is um, protesting another uh, brutal police killing is not inciting a riot. It might be riot worthy, but it's not inciting a riot. It is a protest. It is the right to assemble. I think what's interesting here is they're also they didn't they uh, uh, to be super clear. The Supreme Court decided not to hear this case. Um, they remanded it back to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said already that the police officer can sue DeRay because um, while the right to assemble 
and the right to protest are constitutionally protected. Um, whether or not you get sued for what happens on the on the other side of that, whether you, you can still be sued for a tort is something entirely different. Um, I think he'll be vindicated overall um, and probably win the civil suit. But it, this is this is it is worth the discussion. Certainly see the and, hypocrisy. Yeah. Is screaming and then who at decides us. negligent uh, of them all? Negligent protests. Uh, uh, you know, you got people like the governor of my state and many others that are outlawing protests against law enforcement or outlawing protests uh, on issues that they consider to be, quote, woke issues. Now, I think as these things are, are, are pushed through the law on the other side that hopefully right will win out. But but I'll just say, regardless of the outcome and what happens in DeRay's case and those that are similar to it, let's not mistake what this is. This is a shot over the bow. This is a if you want to try us. Let me tell you to the fullest extent of the law, the parameters and what's allowed, we can take this thing. So if you, um, Angelo Rye, Tiffany Cross, Andrew Gillum, want to use your platform to promote, I don't know, a rally in Baltimore in defense of the former state attorney and something goes left for the law enforcement officers who, by the way, sit at the epicenter of the issue regarding Marilyn Mosby, that we can all of a sudden decide that we're going to. We're going to come for you and we're going to use the instruments of the law to do so. So I I, I, um, I think this is hugely problematic and we shouldn't understate what this is intended to do. It's, in, it's intended to have us tremble before we ever decide to step out in this way or any other against the powers that be. I wish uh, I wish uh, Brother DeRay the best um, as he moves forward. Y'all want to take a quick uh, break to pay some bills. And when we come back. We'll talk the power of the minority. Despite all the lofty rhetoric of democracy, when our political institutions were set up in the 1780s, they actually were set up to benefit in large part a propertied white male minority, a very affluent white male minority, uh, many of whom were slaveholders. And in fact, the public were largely excluded from choosing the country's leaders. And far from encouraging majority rule, the founding institutions of our country. So that was Ari Berman, a journalist and author, talking about this idea of minority rule. Um, Ari touched on it, uh, but we want to know, really, what are the primary strategies that conservative white male minority in this country has used and is using to enact policies and laws that most of us frankly, don't want. And if the majority of us had the opportunity to vote, we wouldn't put it uh, on the books uh, through a citizen vote. But what he touches on, and I know it's touched on by many other authors as well, is whether or not this country is, frankly, truly acting as a de as as a democracy. It's such a good um, and worthy conversation. You know, I thought about some examples while Ari was speaking, I thought about um, the filibuster in the Senate, the fact that a simple majority isn't enough to pass legislation. I thought about the Electoral College. Um, when folks often um, talk about us being three-fifths of a human being, it's because that's what our um, slaveholders would be, could be de we, they were designated three fifths of, an, of a vote based on our personhood. So it wasn't one vote, one, per one person, one vote. I also think about um, authors like you just mentioned before the Mayflower, Lerone Bennett, 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Black AF History, our good brother and friend, Michael Harriet. All these people are our family, by the way. Um, um, and, and I just think that we often um, don't give credit to the fact that we know what we poured into this country, literally our blood um, shed, Crispus Attucks, right, in the Revolutionary War. We know what we built and yet we still don't have because there were it was always designed to be for a select few. I hate the concept of founding fathers because founding fathers in and of itself is very exclusionary. It was a small group of men that mm -hmm. came together, white men that came together and said, how can we reenact the thing that we tried to escape ourselves? <laughs> and then how can we put ourselves in power and make sure that that power stays in the hands of a select few? And then as time went on, 
they continued to to morph this thing, to evolve this thing, to say, and how can we get people who look like us, who don't have what we have, but will be in position mentally to keep us with the, a little bit of power because they know that there's something to aspire to. They can dream to our status, even though they'll never reach it because this is not for them. But if we can convince them that they're better than everybody else who they're similarly situated with, we are going to continue to keep this power in the hands of select few. That is, I think, why Donald Trump appeals to them in that way. It is he is the American dream to these white folks that are carved into the side of a mountain they also don't own and just colonize. So there's all of that. And I, when I think about what democracy really is, we've talked about it on this show a gazillion times. I also think about the fact that we've never really had what we rightfully deserve. It's never really been one person, one vote. It's been one person, one fight for that vote that you may or may not get. It has been um, you're going to have to fight to secure uh, legislation and rights just to survive in this country. Don't even worry about thriving yet, sis. Like, there are so many barriers that exist to our true free existence and liberation in this country. And it was built that way by design. Well, I think the way it, I think that's a great um, historical perspective um, and a wrinkle in time it creates, because when you look at how it plays out today and you consider the changing demographics uh, of the country, we're going to see that increasingly so. Look, we're getting closer to the point where there will not be a racial majority in this country. And yet this very small um, population of people have a stronghold. The Congress last year, the 118th Congress, um, because it was such gridlock, only passed 31 bills, I believe, um, making it the least effective Congress uh, since the Great Depression, to put that in perspective. So it's a lot of things that get left on the table. Um, as of January of this year, Republicans control 28 or 29, uh, 28, 28 state legislators, state legislatures, Democrats control 21. And Andrew, you've made the point so many times that people say the Republican Party and Donald Trump as though they are two separate things. They've merged into one. So when you consider that these MAGA right-wing zealot extremists are controlling most of the state legislatures where a lot of this shitty policy bubbles up to federal policy, that should concern us all. They are out of step with the American people by, uh, by and large. They're out of step with the American people when it comes to reproductive health. They're out of step with the American people when it comes to gun laws. They're out of step with the American people uh, when it comes to racial divides. They're out of step with the American people when it comes to criminal justice reform form. Um, they're out of step with the American people when it comes to climate change. So I, I, yeah. I don't know what to do about it. You know, um, I mean, obviously, we keep saying voting, 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 voting. Uh, but I, I'm a little concerned because I think that, you know, at some point, this country is fractured and the Civil War doesn't start with the first, uh, you know, blow that that struck. The Civil War yeah. starts long before that. And so that's why I say some people say that's dangerous language. It's hyperbolic. I don't think so. I think right now we are seeing this country fracture. And not only is it threatening our livelihood here it is threatening our place uh and, and global diplomacy as well yeah i mean i think you 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 rightly tossed in some ways to what happens in these states even when we get out of whack with where the people are and and, and mind you y'all I, I i'm not a uh, I'm, I'm not an extremist by any stretch and i get why it is that you want common sense showing up on the playing field for instance if Brown v. Board of Education had been put to a popular vote at the time. My guess is the majority of voting Americans at the time would not have uh, reversed right Plessy v. B, uh, v. Ferguson, right? Um, and so we have Supreme Courts, but what what Ari and so many others, Michael Harriot and, and uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, many of those who are keepers of record, our griots, if you will, are saying is. These institutions were established this way by design and they're only effectuating, they're only doing what they're designed to do. The fact that every single state, regardless of population, has two U.S. senators and the majority of those little small states get to decide who sits on the Supreme Court. The fact that when I told students that their direct vote on Election Day didn't equal electing a president, they were baffled. That because we're a democracy, yes, when I go vote, I elect the president. I said, nah, there's another special meeting that's going to happen in December here at the state capitol where the electors for the state of Florida are going to come. It's very little talked about, very little rigmarole because it's just following process. Somebody's going to go into that room, a hundred so odd of them, and they're going to vote 
on electoral votes that will then be sent to Congress. It's important we understand this, y'all, because a lot of us don't realize that there is some distance between us and direct democracy. Yeah. And and here are some of the ways in which it plays out in our states. I want you all to hear it directly. Um, we'll go first to Tennessee, where we see a bill that bans the study. Hear me. A bill that bans the study right. of reparations. Let's hear the sound. The bill is sponsored by Republican Representative John Reagan of Nashville and Memphis Senator Brent Taylor of Memphis. Before the Senate approved the bill, Taylor pointed to Shelby County approving $5 million to study reparations. We know this is a very divisive issue and it's an important issue for many people in our communities. It's an important issue in my community. But Mr. Speaker, it's an issue that cannot be resolved at the local level. No one is alive today who was either a slave or a slaveholder uh, in the time frame that slavery was legal in this country. If there were to be a reparations program, the question becomes, from whom are these reparations taken and to whom are these reparations paid? Yeah, I mean, we could we could go on and on on that sound. But I will I will say it's important to call out um, uh, uh, Tennessee Reverend Earl Fisher. I think, yes. Angela, you know, Earl, uh, uh, Reverend brother. Fisher rather personally, um, who has uh, been on the advocacy side here and has been collecting signatures to a petition, uh, basically telling the legislature to step back, step back. Angela, what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are I don't have a whole lot of hope in the Tennessee state legislature. I just would take y'all back two episodes, right? Like this is the same uh, legislature that is trying to prevent paying Tennessee State University what they what they owe, what they're owed. That is modern reparations. Right. And there are people who are alive who had everything to do with that. And they ain't even trying to pay that. So I'm not confused about why they don't want to study. But here's what we also know. They don't want to study so much that they're taking history books out of classrooms. They don't want us to learn this for free or for pay. They don't want us to learn with their taxpayer dollars or our taxpayer dollars. There's no surprise here. And again, to the point, to the point of Tiffany's book, Tiff, you want to shout out your book? Black voters, white narratives and saving our democracy available everywhere books are sold. What'd you say, Tiff? Say it louder. That's it. I didn't hear it. (laughs) One more time for the people in the back. Louder. That's it. Say it like you're high. I'm just playing. But here's the thing. We have to acknowledge what is the elephant in the room. No pun intended, Republicans. Like we know exactly what you're doing. It is by design. It is at every level. It is at the level of a school board. It is at the state legislature. It is trying to be back in the White House. It is in the halls of Congress. They just took out the DEI office in Congress. What do we expect? Of course, they're not trying to go backwards and look at what they owe us and what was done wrong and what is owed to a people that have given everything to this country. They don't want to give us what we deserve today. There's no surprises here. You want to talk about a wage gap? There's a wage gap and I'm trying to pay what they owe us in paychecks today. Of course, they're not trying to look at what went wrong back in the day. Now, Reverend Earl, you know that that does not mean I'm not going to support the petition. I posted it twice on my stories. I'm going to stand with you, good brother. But I ain't got a lot of hope. Pe- folks got to go to the polls. And it's hard to get folks to go to the polls when we're talking about democracy and the ways in the many ways in which our votes have been suppressed, not counted, and tried to be taken over by Donald Trump and Kanye West publicists. Well, let me tell you, uh, Angela, I mean, and Tiff, you evoked this uh, earlier on in your comments around the emphasis on local, but maybe we aren't down your street yet because we're talking about reparations. We're going to move here now to reproductive rights and see if we get any closer to your street. What's in common here, y'all? You heard it from the the, the senator there. Uh, 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 it's not a local issue to decide reparations. Mm-hmm. So when they don't want to deal with it, right, they want to punt to the federal uh, but when it gets down to reproductive health, which was federally decided. But Andrew, you saying, do know state the states paid slaveholders reparations too. And not slave, not slaves, slaveholders, states pay that. I'm just saying to the brother abso- that, or whatever he is that said that it, anyway. Absolutely. But, but, but we is. but we all see it for what it is. Correct. This this volleying back and forth between right. what is federal and what is state at your convenience. That's so right. let's hear now where they stand on who's responsible 
uh, uh, for women's reproductive health. S- certainly, I'll go ahead and, and, and not bury the lead. It ain't the woman herself. Let's hear the sound. How about that? The Arizona Supreme Court ruled that prosecutors can enforce a anti-abortion law dating to 1864. It is a complete ban on nearly all abortions. It can only be performed to save the life of the mother. There's no exemptions for rape or incest. Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices. He remade the court during his tenure, moved it decisively to the right, and paved the way for the Dobbs decision in 2022 that ended the constitutional national right to an abortion and returned the issue, allowed states to come up with their own laws like the one in Arizona. So this is where we are, folks. The 2024 sitting Supreme Court in Arizona just gave way, tossed back to a civil rights era law that existed on the books that basically prohibited uh, any abortion except in cases of the life of the mother. So which way is it going to be? Is it states' rights? Is it uh, federal rights? Y'all, please, please understand that these things are obviously being chosen at their convenience, which is more important, which is less. But the argument is still fundamental, which is who in the world gets to decide For the majority of us, what issues stand for the day? We've had two presidents in in the 20th century so far who were both elected, sworn in without achieving the national popular vote. Yeah. Arizona is now a swing state and has been thrown back to before the Civil War was settled, before the Civil War was ended. Before Juneteenth for us, before um, enslaved people in Texas were notified of their freedom, right? June 19th, 1865, this law was on the books in 1864. They said, let's hearken back to what we know. You know what this is also called? Y'all know it. Make America great again. That's what they mean. Everything before 1950, that's what they mean. Tiff, you follow, well, you are were part of the press and still are our resident uh, press expert, uh, media news expert. How 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 do people reconcile what's happened in Arizona with Trump's decision and his appointments to the Supreme Court? Make it make sense. Yeah. So this is where um, I think from a from the judiciary branch of government, I don't think that the left in particular focuses as much um, because there are so many other issues under attack. But this is precisely what happens. I think do- during Donald Trump's reign in office, we focus a lot on the Supreme Court. We don't focus as much on the right. lower courts. During Donald Trump's reign in office, he appointed over 200 judges to lifetime appointments, um, predominantly white men, and many of whom who were completely inept inexperienced for the job. Some of these people had never even been on the bench before uh, they were attorneys. Right now, we have an actual handmaiden on the court, um, Amy Coney Bear. It was a literal handmaiden. You can look it up and Google it if you don't believe me. Uh, but even when you look at these folks, I mean, we all remember what happened um, with uh, the, the justice, the frat boy, uh, who was, I like beer. Um, oh, uh, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Justice Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh, um, Kavanaugh. When we saw his testimony, like we could never, would never. And then when you look at what they're upholding at the um, federal level of government. So I, I think it's a lot of consequences. And again, this is an example of what you used to call minority rule, Andrew. This is a tiny amount of people enacting laws and policies that run contrary to our interests. And the, I think the question is, what do we do about it? How do we stop it? And I, I a lot of this, unfortunately, in our lifetimes, we may not see, but I think a lot of this has to be reimagining um, the Supreme Court. Some people talked about expanding the Supreme Court, um, yes, but also just reimagining democracy. That might be a good evergreen, Andrew, uh, just reimagining yeah. a democracy yeah. that, that serves us. Yeah. This is one thing I just want to say here really quick. One like key point is the very thing that you started with on the state level, which was the study of reparations is the very thing that put the minority in position to rule forever. That is financing. They have been able to pay their way to play at every single level. It is by design. We talked about Project 2025. If y'all haven't watched that episode or listened to that episode, run that thing back because it has everything to do with what's happening now. Minority rule through lifetime judicial appointments. Minority rule through being able to buy your way into elected office at every single level. Minority rule through burrowing into career level positions on the state, local, and federal level. Government paid positions that y'all's taxpayer dollars are paying for that is how the minority continues to rule through strategy through money and by occupying all of those seats that is how so if we don't take that over through our act our act our act our um jesus activism 
Yeah. Is all I'm trying to get out of my mouth. Yeah. If we don't take it over that way, I don't know that we can outpace them from a funding perspective. We fight to get our folks to see, hey, this America First legal thing that Stephen Miller is doing, the stuff that Ed Bloom is doing, we need our own version of that, not to counter those attacks, but to have some proactive attacks. We will not be able to win on a lot of those cases because minority rule has found itself into lifetime appointments in the judicial branch. We have to start plan- like planning for these things in a a lot more strategic way and it's very difficult to do when all we're trying to do is live when we interact with the police officer and when all we're trying to do is make sure that we can make ends meet when our wages aren't the same right. as everyone else when all we're trying to do is make sure that on the other side of a of a rape situation or an incest or a mis- or a mistake one bad night people aren't stuck with a lifetime of a decision because of whatever anyway I'm down the well, road. Angela, but you I, what I I'm actually saying. I know you I know you're going in there. It's one of the reasons why I would love for us to hear a listener question right after this break that hits a little bit on those themes, except in a way that I think you probably you probably wouldn't guess. Hey Native Land Pod. My name is Diallo. I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm 23 years old. My question is is I feel like there's an elephant in the room, especially being in the South, that even though a large majority of black religious voters, I subscribe to Christianity, vote democratic, we also hold conservative and traditional values, but there seems to be the democratic party, not like a, a, a really planned and robust way to, to reach the black religious voter. And I think it can just be frustrating because anytime we talk about faith, we're kind of lumped in with white evangelicalism, even when it comes to to different views, um, even such things as abortion. I think black people, we have more of a moderate view of abortion that is not necessarily aligning with the Democratic Party and not necessarily aligning with the Republican Party. So what do you guys think that we can do to address this, address these types of voters? Have you guys seen this? Uh, I appreciate that, Diallo. What do you think? Tiff? I, I think he's saying a lot um, of a very point, making a very poignant point that is often lost on both parties. Uh, and we've said this here a lot. We are not a homogenous group of people. We're not a homogenous voting block. We have varying different socioeconomic backgrounds that drive our interest here. Um, I think it's so un- unfortunate because where our commonality is, can we just live? Can you stop shooting us? Can you allow us the freedom uh, to breathe and thrive and take care of our children and pay our mortgage and all the things that the, the rest of um, mostly white America gets to do. Um, when it comes to the conservative uh, part of the black vote, I think the media narrative has gotten this completely wrong, uh, suggesting that there's this drove of black men voting for Donald Trump. I don't think that's true. I think there are people who go to church every Sunday who probably don't believe in um, gender, some of the uh, like same loving gender um, policies out there. I, I have a challenge with that. I don't b- believe in that and I don't support that um, kind of discrimination. But certainly there are black folks who feel that way. There is certainly a high pocket of black folks who Um, don't support marijuana legislation. I've seen a whole lot of preachers in the pulpit talk about, um, you know, why you want to support a law that'll dull your mind and make you think things. Mm -hmm. I think these things are out of step with um, society, and I think that they are um, out of step with the the way most of America goes. But there are people in my own family feel some of these things. So I'm happy to get the question because I think it shows that um, there is a wide swath of people. The Democratic Party has to be a big tent of folks and punctual the point that we have to have more than a two-party system. I would hope that this man um, can continue to vote in the interest of the greater good. That's where we as black folks don't have the privilege to say, yeah. well, I like this person. They yeah. speak directly to me. We have to always think community. I might not agree with every single thing this person says, but in the interest of my community, I'm going to vote in, in this particular party or for this particular candidate. Yeah. Speaking of, of of caring about all of those in our community, um, this past week, we acknowledged, um, lifted up Black Maternal Health Week. Um, uh, uh, our mothers, we've got to care for our mamas and those who are aspiring in that way. And we all know the numbers are staggering when it comes to infant mortality, Black infant mortality, m- mortality and Black maternal health. Angela, I know this is an issue that's also very, very close to you. Um, um, Building upon this theme of us caring after all of those in our community, what would be the charge as, as, as we close out this acknowledgement, this recognition of black maternal health and infant mortality? 
Um, so, yeah, I think the most important thing is that people understand the disparities that exist. Oftentimes when folks are uh, fighting the, the ghost of racism that they think does not exist, they fail to take data into consideration. Yeah. So if black women are dying in childbirth three times at a rate three times higher than white women, I think that speaks volumes. I know we have a clip. Um, from Dr. Cleopatra Camperveen, who um, speaks about the prejudiced brain um, and why it's so important to care about black maternal health. My brain is prejudiced and your brain is prejudiced. And this prejudice accounts for the up to 80% of maternal deaths that are preventable. I'm Dr. Cleopatra, fertility scientist, and I want to show you how. Our brains use mental shortcuts called schemas to quickly process information. This allowed our ancestors to survive, but today it divides us into us versus them. And when they become less human in the eyes of us, it leads directly to the tragedy of lives lost, of mothers who could have been saved, mothers like my own mother who I lost at birth. I know it's tough to hear, and I promise you it's even tougher to live. That's why we need urgent systems in place that actively counter the human brain's natural tendency toward prejudice and bias. Our Color Me Mommy Toolkit, the Momnibus Bill, these are not just initiatives, they are actual lifelines. Hmm. She raises some really good points, and I know we also have a question on this issue. Hey, hello, Native Land Pod. Uh, my name is Olivia Atley. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm a full spectrum doula and a mama of two. My question for you all is, as we know the awful state of maternal and infant mortality in our country, especially as it pertains to black and brown individuals, I'm wanting to know y'all's opinion and advice on how we keep the very important agenda in front of our legislators to improve these rates in a way that is fresh and relevant so that they won't forget it and they won't think that it's no longer a problem or an issue. Just wanting some more advice on how we continue to push this agenda forward. What else can and should we be doing? Thank you. That's real. You know, I think about um, the the work that Kamala was engaging in as a senator, and now uh, many others continue that work, um, in including Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and so many other black women. Shout out to the CBC women. Um, there's a Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act that um, works to create conditions conducive to safe birthing experiences. Uh, a lot of times when black women are talking about any pain they're experiencing, they're not believed and that is how many of these uh, deaths occur. Just simple belief. If someone is telling you they're in pain or something doesn't feel right, this woman has lived in her body her whole life. You should probably listen to her. So this um, bill, as well as many others, um, works to protect black women um, in their birthing experiences. It shouldn't be traumatic. It should be the most joyful time right. of their lives. I know I'm working to become a mom. Um, the fertility journey has been a brutal one for me. Um, and I'll tell you the truth. I'm like, okay, after we can get an embryo made and it implants, and I just hope that I can have a safe birth. A dear friend of ours, um, Stephanie Young, recently gave birth yeah. to a beautiful baby Congrats, girl. Congrats, Steph. Steph. And even hearing about some of Steph's complications. You know, you hit 40 and the things just, it gets really challenging. Thank God she has a healthy baby. Thank God she's healthy. But all along the journey, there are different things. They just hit us differently. So we yeah. need to be made aware. And shout out to all of the folks who work so diligently to create Black Maternal Health Week. Yeah, and you know, e even not dealing with you know pregnancies in advanced age or what is considered more advanced, um, higher risk age. Yeah, you have the issues of women who report pain while still in the hospital or immediately after release, and you have doctors who chalk it up to oh she just wants a prescribed a painkiller. You know, oh you know take some Tylenol, it'll be okay. And days later, if that the woman perishes and nobody has yeah. an explicable reason as to why I've had it happen to classmates, to friends, to others, um, kids who have been orphaned while their mothers lay, you know, practically on the delivery table. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 our need to give voice to this is important. And I appreciate you lifting this up as we close out, um, uh, black maternal, um, uh, uh, health week. Um, this ought to be a topic that's 365. So y'all keep the conversation going and speaking of women and their value.
I don't want to be out of tune by making this connection, but when we talk about what is being paid, offered women um, for their work, it doesn't just happen in corporate places. It's not just happening in chains. Um, it's happening in some of the most high profile environments that you and I know, the WNBA. Let's hear from WNBA star Kelsey Plum, who explains how the NBA and the WNBA players are paid so differently. You know, we talk about the CBA, right? So the collecting bargaining agreement and uh, in the NBA, um, they have percentages of revenue shared for the players, right? right. So jersey yeah. sales, obviously their TV contracts. So you see these every year, these contracts get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Yeah, massive. But but that's because their CBA it negotiates where the, you know, if the owners are making certain types of money, they get that as well. Got it. In the WNBA, that's not the case. Oh, wow. Mm. So in 2025, that's our new, you know, op opportunity to renegotiate or opt out. Um, so there are definitely future opportunities coming, but I will say that um, it's one of those things that we, we are not asking to get paid what the men get paid. We're asking to get paid the same percentage of revenue shared. Okay. You know what I'm got saying? It, got got it. It. So that's a huge misconception. That's a huge misconception. Yeah. Got it. Okay. For sure. Yeah, because every video is like, oh, this person gets paid this, this, this no. person gets yeah. paid that, right? So I want to be really clear about that. Like, I don't think I, I should get paid the same as LeBron. Right. But the percentage of revenue, like, for example, they sell my jersey in Mandalay Bay. I don't get a dime. You don't get any money from jersey sales? That's crazy. Yeah. Um, this is this is one tiff. I know you're a resident sports expert, right? Um, but I saw you know what? I'm gonna wait. Thank for the you because you guys yeah, like to ahead. step on my toes when it comes to sports, and you know that's right. my thing. So if I may have the floor that's for a second, so rude. um, Kelsey Plum. Uh, I don't want to outshine anybody, so I'll let Angela tell us who she plays for. But she is an amazing WNBA star. And I thought this was such a poignant point because I get so tired of hearing the men talk about, you know, well, they don't make as much money. Um, or, or not even just the men, but, but people make the point that they don't make as much money as the men, so why should they get paid? I love how she broke this down. It is all about collective bargaining, the collective bargaining agreement, the CBA. This is a union issue. They, The uh, WNBA has a, um, a Players Association just like the NBA does, somebody who goes to the bargaining table and set these contracts. As we know, Caitlin Clark at no point in her contract will make six figures. Now, her endorsements will carry her over. She'll be fine. But that's one player. Angel Reese, that's one player. There are hundreds of players in the WNBA who will never make that much money. I have to say, too, even though I, I completely support Kelsey Plum's point, the other challenge I will make is to consumers, viewers, women in particular. Yes. I'm calling on you. Watch the WNBA. Get into it. I despite being a sports expert, um, don't always watch every single game. And I've been into it. We, Angela, our group chat, we are in it. We were watching the draft. We were talking about what people were wearing, who was going to what team. It was so exciting. Watching the playoffs uh, at the college level was so exciting for me. And I have to say, I think, Angela, you made this point too. I kind of feel like the women's um, sports arm of this is a lot more interesting than the, than the WNBA. I look at the coaches on the sideline. Watching Don I mean, Staley coach, I mean, that is watching oh magic. Gosh. I'm getting so excited watching yeah. it. You said oh, the women's, watch the, women's watch the teams sport. are more excited than the WNBA. I just wanted to fix it. What, is, what did I what say? I know you are. You said the WNBA, that's still women. I just think you oh. just was excited. Well, I get so excited when we yeah. talk about sports because I'm so passionate about this <laughs> subject, so I may have misspoke. But really, if you if you want to see these women make more money, one thing you can do is watch the WNBA. And I personally am looking for a team. And I said wherever uh, Angel Reese went to play um, will be my team, and she's going to Chicago. So that might be my team. I'm not fully committed yet, but that might be my team. Stay tuned. I think I they should it. draft you, Tiff. I, I you honestly be, would they, love they, to do some sort of commentary, color commentary, the towel, what, whatever oh, I need to do. Want I want to be a part of it. I would know, like right? to be a part of I it. Listen, I listen. Here's here's the, the one thing that I was going to say, and it goes right to the heart of what Tiff was saying around consumers. Mm. Um, I know she has an a weed is vegan shirt, but we're not quite at that consumption piece yet. We're just <sighs> talking next. about consuming the sport. What I think we also need to understand is the importance of ticket sales. People need to go to the games. Don't be like, oh, these salaries are such a shame, but you know that you're buying LaMelo sneakers, but you ain't never picked up a Stewie sneaker. Like, what yeah. are we even talking about? So I think that you got to understand the role that we also play in this. We go to the polls. We also got to go to the courts You and go to the courts for the girls. To Tiff's point, I was making the argument and the numbers reflect the same. The Final Four, NCAA Final Four Championship for the women outpaced the men. So let's just I be very clear about this. I didn't even know that. Did this. it really? 
Yes. That's amazing. More viewers because it was a it was a anyway, it was way more exciting I game. Love it. And I, I also think that we have to understand that that has to translate over to the WNBA. I love the folks talking about salaries. It is not an issue that we know again that's exclusive to the WNBA. We have pay disparities across Correct. the board, but this is one where we could really um, run the court on, no pun intended, um, to ensure that that Can changes. I ask a quick question? That's real. This is to Angela. Um, our, the machetes, our group chat, what game are we going to? What game should we go to? Can I tell? I'm biased what? because, you know, I don't have my Sonics anymore in Seattle. Oh, so, gosh. Andrew, you're also invited. You can be Thank honorary you. machete. We got some Thank guys you. in this honorary machetes. <laughs> the thing that I would say is I would love to go to the Seattle Storm. We have a black coach. She is incredible. We have... Uh, and NECA is now on the team. We got Skyler on the team. Um, we lost Stewie, but we have a we have a good bench. And Sue Bird, of course, is retired. But the, I think this is going to be a is really is it like a premiere season. game though, like the a season yes. opener? If season you're there, opener. friend, if you're there, it's, it's a premiere, premiere game. Thank you. It's premiere. And no, sorry, it's Noel premiere. Quinn is who I'm talking about. I love Noel. She is incredible. Uh, she's the coach of the Seattle Storm. So y'all are always welcome to support my team. I'm trying to get season tickets. I just want to go and well, I want to be courtside at like the, the season opener premiere game and cheer the on all yes. the, the It's premiere opener. if you're there, friend. Okay. If Let you're there, you, it's when premiere. When does the season but, start? But, but, but all um, the it's, points it's, are it's, well, well made. Somebody in the comments tell me when the May, season starts. May, May 14th. I'm trying May to get 14th. there. Andrew's okay. in a bit of a May point. May 14th. Yeah. My bad, Andrew. I, look, I, I just want to make sure we get it all in. Against and speaking of getting Leafs. it in, after this commercial break, Are we have a quick little high? highlight as we yet? celebrate the one and only 420. Not faux. <laughs> faux. <laughs> 20. <laughs> Not a purr. Faux. 20. This we'll be right back. This needs help. As we consider the state of play um, on this 420, this approaching 420, I didn't get the memo for, you know, broadcasting my position on this. Uh, when I was running for governor, I was for full uh, recreational and uh, medical uh, legalization. Thumbs up. But my there friend over here, Tiff, hey, that's a celebration happening behind us, uh, came Back. fully prepared. But before I toss it over to you, Tiffany, just want to acknowledge that and the time, the, the ways we have come, if you will. Um, I threw a map Very up sweet. on the screen here, which just shows that the overwhelming majority of states have already legalized some form of medicinal use of marijuana. And for those who get it confused and think you got to clutch your pearls when we mention this, I got a couple of aunties and uncles and stuff who, who are on the gummies that help them sleep and rest. Uh, so don't judge too quickly mm -hmm. um, because we don't know what's in your medicine box yet. Um, the, don't lie. Uh, they're, they're right. Uh, outstanding part of this is not necessarily the medical or the recreational catching up, but really the federal government catching up with states with states, and what they are already doing uh, to reduce the stigma around medical marijuana. Now, Tiff, I think your shirt applies whether we're talking about medicinally or recreationally. Uh, but tell us, where do you stand as we approach 420. Well, uh, this may shock you, but I am pro uh, legalization of marijuana. Um, listen, if you're watching this on a Saturday. Everywhere, exactly, every time, If you're watching day. this on this Saturday, uh, happy 420 to you. Saturday uh, is the day that weed smokers unite, I would say, in one big puff, puff, pass communion. Um, but before you celebrate that sticky icky, I think it's important <laughs> that you know. Take, a, take oh, a, a time back to when, and we were alive during this time. Sticky icky, um, icky. That these Mary Jane exchanges were uh, confined to street corners or you had your, your dude, so to speak, um, on speed dial. But now, just as Andrew pointed out, that most of the country has legalized um, some, the, the, the drug. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. So while some of us are certainly enjoying one kind of green, there's a whole other group of people pocketing another kind of green. And what's worse is marijuana laws mm. still devastated communities. They still put uh, or ensnared a bunch of black people into a very unforgiving criminal justice system, which we talked about on this show. Um, according to the ACLU, um, marijuana arrests once uh, accounted for over half half 
the drug arrest in this country. So think about that. And while people are still uh, building wealth, there are people who are still in jail today um, because of laws having to do with uh, marijuana. So if you want to sell weed legally today, which I think is a really big issue uh, in the black community, shout out to Andre Iguodala, Al Harrington, and other people out there who are trying to uh, get into the dispensary game. Um, but you need a license to sell. That can cost you up to $120,000, if not more now. Throw in legal fees, insurance, rental fees, marketing, taxes, and your cost can literally balloon into the millions of dollars. And with the wealth gap, I don't have to tell you guys about that. Um, black folks are far less likely to get loans uh, to support this kind of business. So in some regards, we are left out of the rotation. Um, there are some programs intending to address this, but they have a long way to go. So as you're doing your puff, puff, pass, however you're celebrating uh, 420 before you roll up those backwoods, just put a lot more thought and energy. I would invite you into the kind of green you can pocket, not just the kind of green you can inhale. All right, co-hosts, we're at the point of our calls to actions. What you got, Angela? What you thinking this week? Oh, I'm first. Your first. Um, first. You know, I like where Tiff was um, in the section where we talked about um, supporting women's sports. Um, so join us as we all go to a season opener. I think ah. this is a good challenge, Tiff. Hopefully we all can get to Seattle on May 14th. If not, find one in your hometown or near a hometown. Go support these incredible women hooping, like running circles around some of these dudes out here. So that is going to be my call to action. Support the WNBA. Don't just post about it. Don't just complain about it. Go buy a ticket about it. I love that. Yes. And tell yes. us in the comments which team, which opener we should go to, what team we should be supporting. I'm curious to hear from you guys as I navigate my journey into the WNBA. Is that my your, that's, that's your no, that's not my call oh, okay. to action. No, all right, all I was right. just echoing my sister Angela because we're we're we need input from the group at large to see where we're gonna which game we're gonna go to. My I'm call to action to is <laughs> I know you are, but I mean for our whole group to go together. Okay, I'm down okay, to go okay. to Seattle, but I want to see where everybody else has to say. My call <laughs> yes, to action this week, um, it's a very niche, so I apologize for to the people this doesn't apply to. It's a call to action and a shout out. I want we've shouted out Nicole Hannah Jones a few times on this um episode, but I I want to shout her out again. I attended um, an event that she did last night at Howard University with her journalism students. There were um, probably two, three hundred people there and her students love her. Like everyone in the, I think, the comms department who are learning from her. And it made me think because I get so much outreach from students when I meet people, when I'm out. I just did an event at the Gathering Spot. Shout out to the Gathering Spot, by the way, where I broadcast from. I just did an event at the Gathering Spot in Atlanta. And so many people will come up to me and say, I want to do what you do. I want want to be a journalist. And when I start asking those questions, what papers do you read every day? What niche are you interested in? Who are some of your favorite bylines they can't answer? So I, my heart was full last night watching these students really study the craft, really understand what it is to be a journalist, understanding. She's teaching them about sourcing, about fact-finding, about reporting. I think some people um, conflate that. A lot of you guys out there who ask me, what you know that you want to do what I do you think it's about going on TV giving your opinion and that's not it I don't care about your opinion maybe some people do but mostly I don't care why if you haven't Angela worked on Capitol Hill was a strategist um Andrew was a politician like these were jobs and careers um that that people have and so um you know you have to kind of earn that place to give your opinion journalism is reporting it's fact finding it's news gathering so if that is a career that you want to pursue young people I beg you take it seriously Seriously, get into a great J school, learn how to do it. There's an art to, to sharing information, to uh, fact finding, to uh, fact checking. Um, learn it, understand it, study it, take it seriously, and then enter the profession uh, and honor it as it should be because it has such credo in the black community about mm. bearing witness and coming back and reporting what you've uncovered. Mm, I feel that. I feel, you remind me of like one of my PD, professional development teachers, who would always just call us to hire uh, service, higher delivery. If you want to do this, there's some things you got to get in place before you get there. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I feel that. I often share that when I'm talking to folks about running for office. Look, what do you care about? What what motivates you? What gives you that you know fire in the belly to go get it done? Well, my CTA, y'all, one, join me in finding a constructive way um, to celebrate 420. It'll be my first time trying to do that uh, uh, in real form. And then I want to reiterate a... Um, or a CTA that was, I think, issued last week or the week before. 
would love, love, love to keep hearing from you all about the kinds of ads you want to hear in the political season. Mm. I think it's just so Angela Rift real strong on um, uh, uh, I thought was an ideal ad from someone putting, you know, um, their circumstance centerfold and then letting that power uh, through commercials speak for themselves, put at the epicenter of the issue of 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 I don't know black inclusion the folks who have been left out I gave the example of my kids who never had a black teacher and so it mattered to see a black person in the front of the classroom I just saw the cast of a different world getting their roses while they're here yeah. if I could tell them myself I would say they are the reason I went to college I tried to go to Hillman but I didn't know it was fake <laughs> um, 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 uh, I learned that in the process of sending my SAT scores out and I couldn't find the code for Hillman. Uh, so it didn't go to Hillman. Um, but whatever that that um, that that might be, that thing that brings you in, that reels you in, that story that you hear that says, man, they are walking down my street. Keep sharing those with us because you don't know who we know. It might end up in an ad somewhere. You may end up in an ad somewhere. So so keep giving us that? those ideas that you think might I be good that. to move, motivate and inspire you to get to the polls. And before we wrap this episode, y'all, we can't leave without asking you to um leave a review subscribe to native land pod the more you subscribe the more you download an episode even if you have to delete it after you listen to it um that helps us um on the algorithms show up in your and your friends um, um uh, respective social media feeds um new episodes drop as you probably know by now every thursday you can also follow us on social media we are angela ride tiffany cross and andrew gillum Welcome home, y'all. There are approximately, oh. if not exactly, 200 days until Election Day. Lord help. Welcome home, y'all. Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to get your favorite shows.